Okay, we'll get to the exciting technology here in just a moment. We're in a series called With Jesus. If you're just joining us, the series is really a theme that will take us all the way through Advent and we'll have smaller subsets within it. And the whole goal here is that we don't live compartmentalized lives. I don't know about you. I do know about some of you, but I don't know about all of you. <laughs> but about my own life is I tend to um, section off what parts of my life God has full access to. Maybe that's not a good thing for a pastor to confess, but it's true. And maybe you're the same way. Some parts of my life, I want all that he, God wants to give me. Other parts of my life, I'd rather maintain some control myself or not talk about it all with him. And I don't see compartmentalization in the Gospels. When Jesus calls his disciples to follow him, to be with him, it's not a part-time thing. It's not a nine-to-five thing. It's not a sometime thing. It's surrender your life, come follow me, and be with me. That's the call, to be with Jesus. So what does it mean for us, in our context, to be with him at all times? One of the things we're going to look at now in this little mini-series within this theme with Jesus is the people Jesus ate meals with. That might strike you as an odd thing to focus on, but it's profoundly important for us to understand. There are a surprising number of accounts of Jesus eating with people, and in fact, Jesus was always in trouble with the religious leaders of his day for who he ate with, tax collectors and sinners. We're going to examine the well-known story of a man named Zacchaeus. He was Scottish. Did you know that? So you know. I love dumb pastor jokes because he was wee. He was a wee little man. Wee. I could have said he was a little piggy, but I didn't say that. So I brought along some new technology to help us make sense of this story. How many of you remember flannel graphs? You want to see what's amazing, what's underneath it? This is like, you can't do this today. The ocean and the land. Incredible. So we're going to, I've never actually used one. So we'll see if I get this right. I told you to get out your app, now I'm using the flannel board. I just thought this would be fun. This is not actually the first tax collector that Jesus ate with or encountered. He did this regularly, but one of the more famous ones besides Zacchaeus, anybody know? Matthew, Levi, who would become one of his disciples. And this is just an aside, but isn't it amazing how amazing Jesus is? Matthew, Levi is a tax collector who was hated by his own people. We'll get to that in a minute. And do you know who Simon was? Not Simon who becomes Peter, but Simon the Zealot. You know who Zealots were? Political activists, radicals. You could not find two people more diametrically opposed than a zealot and a tax collector. And yet Jesus calls them both to be with him. The, the, the family of God, the call of discipleship, is not a call to homogenous life with all the people that are just like me. It's being reconciled to follow Jesus with people you would not otherwise associate with. But because he loves you and gave himself for you, you call them brother and sister. You read about Matthew's story in Matthew chapter 9. But from the perspective of the religious leaders of his day, Jesus was doing two very shocking and offensive things. One, he's talking about the kingdom of God and claiming divine authority in that kingdom. And two, he's including all the wrong people in this kingdom. It was incongruous to the Jews. How can you claim divine authority? You're a human being. How can you talk about the kingdom of God and then spend time with those people? Jesus' behavior was actually reason for the Jews, the Pharisees, and teachers of the law not to believe in him. In the ancient world, particularly in ancient Eastern cultures, table fellowship, eating with someone, was a very important part of life. There was a rabbinic saying in the Mishnah, only the marriage bed is more sacred than the family table in the home. And the evening meal was the very center of family life in Jewish culture. To have someone into your home and share an evening meal with them was essentially by action to say to the world, I accept this person. We're at peace. We're one. We're connected. Jews believed that in entertaining and eating with visitors, they might actually be receiving angels unawares or God himself, as the case with Abraham in Genesis 18. But on the other hand, Jews were not supposed to just eat with anybody there were very strict rules about who they could associate with. Another rabbinic saying in the Mishnah, that to eat the bread of a Gentile was to eat the flesh of a swine. So you, it was very important 
the symbolic acceptance of table fellowship, but you couldn't just have anybody sit down with you. There were strict rules about who could be at their table. To share a meal with someone was a very significant thing. This is why the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were angry with Jesus repeatedly because of who he ate with, who he sat down to table with. And they're getting so worked up with it, it was shocking to them. It made no sense. Now, we do not have the same cultural values around table fellowship today, do we? We don't. We eat in our cars in a rush. We eat in a hurry. I miss the days when my children were young and we would sit around the table. In fact, the National Honor Society, or excuse me, the National Merit Scholarship Society did a research project on the significant commonalities across socioeconomic, gender, race, uh, cultural backgrounds between all of those students. And they found that one of the surprising things those students had in common was they came from families that ate t meals together three times or more a week when they were young. There's a research project going on now called the Family Meal Project examining the benefits of this. Lower rates of, de of teenage depression and anxiety, higher grade point average, and so on. It's remarkable. Eating together matters. Abraham Heschel, Jewish theologian in his book The Sabbath, says, you become like those you eat with most often. So if you're eating by yourself in your car, that's not good. <laughs> so I want to encourage you as we go through this and get to the text now and go through this little mini-series on who Jesus ate with to be thinking about these three things. Number one, what can I learn from the people Jesus ate meals with? What can I learn about Jesus about myself? Number two, what does it mean for me to sit at Jesus' table? And number three, how can I invite others to his table? What can I learn about Jesus and about myself? What does it mean for me to eat with Jesus, be at his table? And how can I invite others into that same fellowship? Okay, Luke chapter 19, if you have your Bibles. Luke chapter 19, the famous story here of Jesus and Zach. 1 through 10, we'll read the first 10 verses. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. I'm going to guess that story is familiar to you, which is why I brought along this very high-tech, the tree, look, the tree, this is the actual sycamore tree, if you know that or not. I don't know, it's like magic how it sticks, I don't know how that works, but it does. And this is Zacchaeus, can you see Zacchaeus? You can't because he's wee. And he's sitting in the tree, just like that. <laughs> This is fun. <laughs> and there was a crowd. There's a crowd. And then there was Jesus, who apparently had red lips and blue eyes. And he was giant, as tall as the tree. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were the religious leaders facing the wrong direction and judging Jesus. And there's a bag of money, which we'll get to later. And that's all that I have. All right. Good, we can wrap up. You got it? <laughs> I all had a temptation to bring a whale up here, but that was a different story. <laughs> all right, even though this story is familiar, to get the full depth of what got, what's going on here, we had to do a little con contextual background. Israel, of course, is occupied under Roman rule. Uh, Israel's King Herod and the Tetrarchs, they, they were um, puppet kings. Rome didn't mind if the Jews kept their own religion. 
They didn't mind if they kept their own religious laws. They cared about two things. You keep the peace. That was the main thing, the Pax Romana. And number two, you pay your taxes. If you, were, if you didn't cause trouble and if you paid your taxes, they didn't really much care what else you did. And they set up systems to, for tax collection. Here's how it worked. The Roman government would set up, would give the uh, tax collection uh, responsibility to a, a segment of the legion, of the Roman army. Those, the army officials then would very often, most frequently, they would hire wealthy individuals who would, oh, they would hire them, excuse me, they would give those individuals the right to pay for the privilege of collecting taxes. Those individuals would pay a fee to Rome to be able to be the tax collectors, the chief tax collectors. They would hire underlings to actually go and do the collecting in the booths. So when we read that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and wealthy, it's likely what Luke is saying to us is he's one of those ones who bought the right from Rome to extort money from his own people. Because he's paying Rome to collect taxes, Rome's taxes. So he's got to make up that payment. And also then he's got to have an income. He's hiring underling tax collectors to do the actual collection at the booths along the, the roads at collection time. He's got to pay them. So who's going to pay all this? The people, the oppressed people, the Jews themselves, would have to build into their taxes, would, would be, they would be charged enough to pay the tax collectors, the chief tax collectors, and what they're paying Rome. Caesar is going to get his, of course. So it's the Jewish people who hate Roman occupation to begin with for religious reasons. And for political reasons, they view tax collectors as worse than Gentiles. They're traitors to their own people. So that's who Zacchaeus is. Plus, he's short. Get a picture of him? Sneaky little cheat. Hated by his own people, but wealthy. Backed by Rome. You can't touch him because he's got the Roman army as his backing. That's Zacchaeus, a collaborator, a traitor. Now, we don't know this to be true, but why would Zacchaeus get up in that tree? To see Jesus. Well, why would he want to see Jesus? I'm speculating here, but it's likely, it seems to me, that Zacchaeus, though he was wealthy, was also isolated and alone in his life. Deep inside, unfulfilled. Here's about this Jesus. Longs to see him, to encounter him. What will he do? What can we learn about Jesus from this encounter? Jesus says at the end of the story that he came to seek and to save the lost. Now, when we hear the word lost, we think about somebody that's unsaved or doomed for destruction sometimes. We, we have to be careful about that word because the word literally means in the wrong place or headed in the wrong direction. And you can be inside the family of God and in the wrong place in your life. You could be in church and headed in the wrong direction. Zacchaeus is, by birth, a member of the family of God, a Jew. But he's clearly in the wrong place and going in the wrong direction in his life. And Jesus came to seek him and save him. So the first thing we see is that you must, if you want to encounter Jesus, a life-changing encounter with Jesus, number one, you've got to get over yourself. My wife said that to me once, get over yourself. Actually, more than once. What does that mean? What do we mean here? What is Zacchaeus, how does Zacchaeus get over himself? The first obstacle or barrier between us and encountering Jesus is our own pride. Our own sense of dignity. For Zacchaeus to climb a tree, he had to set aside his pride and dignity in that culture. This is not something that respected Jewish men did. Climbing trees is okay for children, but grown men don't hike up their robes and climb up into trees. It's beneath them. It's silly. It's foolish behavior. Undignified. Yet he did it. My wife and my son... Uh, Benjamin, our youngest son, went to the Cubs parade after they had won the World Series in 2016. Do you remember that? Let's all just take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> they went to the parade where however many, three million, whatever they say, were, were downtown Chicago. And there was a crushing crowd around. And my son climbed up on the side of a light pole. My wife was saying, get down, get down, because he wanted to see the Cubs. And there were, my wife said when she realized that, that she was kind of embarrassed that Ben was doing that. She looked around, there were grown men in trees all over the place <laughs> trying to see the Cubs as they came by on the parade. 
This is what the Apostle Paul means when he says that we are fools for Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Are you willing to look foolish to the world because you desperately want to encounter Jesus? You cannot have the saving power of Jesus flowing into and through your life if you aren't willing to risk looking a little foolish to the culture in which you live. A good friend of mine says that love is like dancing. You cannot do it if you're afraid of looking like a fool. True, isn't it? If you're worried about what everyone thinks around you. Zacchaeus, in this moment, apparently, his desire to see Jesus is greater than his concern about what others will think. And that convicts me. Do you ever find yourself feeling a little insecure or apologetic even about your faith? Do you ever find yourself out at a restaurant or a coffee shop talking about things of faith with somebody and then lowering your voice a little bit because you don't want to come across as weird as somebody seated nearby? Has that ever happened to you? Do you ever just hold back a bit? One of the things I love about Jerry, Jerry Root, who preached last week, is that he's just not like that. I can't tell you the number of times that I've been with him and he's, at, at, well, I'll give you an example. A number of years ago, I was preaching on heaven and hell in a lecture called Hereafter when Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, came out and people were wondering about, uh, you know, universalism and what does the Bible teach. And we did a lecture seminar and I was studying for that. We went out to lunch at Chili's in Donata Square in Wheaton, sitting with Jerry having lunch. And a woman comes over who's our server. Her name was Chloe. And Jerry said, Chloe, what do you believe about heaven and hell? She goes, well, I don't believe in hell, but I believe in heaven. Tell me about that, Jerry said. She went on and talked about reincarnation and some convoluted thing. Jerry's writing notes down on a napkin. She said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just taking notes. She said, why? He said, because I, th I find it fascinating what you believe. My friend here is teaching on heaven and hell, and what you say might help, be helpful to him. She said, oh, okay, that's nice. So she served us and came back with our chips and salsa and brought our meals. The conversation kept going. And then eventually she said to Jerry, well, what do you believe? He says, well, and he get, shared the gospel. The kingdom of heaven, the presence of God, what's waiting for all of us. She said, that's amazing, that's beautiful. And Jerry led her to Christ right there at our table. <laughs> and on the way out, he hands me the napkin. He goes, look, I did your research for you. <laughs> Unapologetic, unafraid to share. You can't have the saving power of Jesus flowing into your life and through your life if you're just worried about looking like a fool or being judged. Children naturally understand this. But as adults, we forget sometimes. Remember the toodles in um, uh, the, the Peter Pan, one of the Lost Boys? Do you remember this? At the end, when he's uh, left Never Neverland, he says to the police constable, I've forgotten how to fly. And the constable says, one does. The gospel says, you don't have to. When Jesus says in Matthew 18 to the disciples, he brings a little child over and he says, unless you change and become like this child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying? Not become childish, selfish and me-centered, but childlike, full of wonder and awe and joy at the world. I think we lose that as we grow up. Recovering something, a deep desire to see Jesus, to believe in the power of the resurrection. In, in the Narnian Chronicles, Susie Pevensey, the oldest of the two sisters, the Pevensey children, in the last couple books, she can't go back to Narnia. If you've read the books, you know this. Do you know why? Remember why? Lewis says because she's only concerned with nylons and lipstick. Do you remember <laughs> nylons? Nobody wears nylons. Anyway, his point was not that he got accused of being a misogynist for this. His point is that she's lost belief in the supernatural, that other worlds exist. What's at the heart of the Christian faith? is that there's another world. This life is not all there is. That God broke into this world. That he sent himself in the form of his son into our world to live as one of us, a perfect life, to die an unjust death and to be raised from the dead, conquering the powers of sin and death. And he will return. That's supernatural stuff. To some, that's fairy tale stuff. C.S. Lewis said when he was a young adolescent and early adult, he was embarrassed to be caught reading fantasy children's stories in public. But as an adult, he reads them openly and with joy. You must get over yourself if you want to meet Jesus. 
Martin Luther King Jr. said, I refuse to believe that we are the mere flotsam and jetsam in the river of life, unable to respond to the eternal God that forever confronts us. There's more than we see. So spiritually speaking, to grow up does not mean to lose our belief in the supernatural. It means quite the opposite, to cling to it. Second thing Zacchaeus does, and it's necessary for us to experience the, uh, the salvation of Jesus, is get over the crowd. And I realize I've messed up an image. That's okay. Get over the crowd. For Zacchaeus, this was both a physical and a social necessity. Let me read verses 4 through 6 again. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass by. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried came down and received him joyfully. Notice what was keeping Zacchaeus from meeting Jesus was the crowd, the other people. You must get over your own pride, your own sense of dignity, your own issues if you want to meet Jesus, and you must get over the behavior of other people. How many of you have either thought or heard someone say something like this? I have a hard time believing in God because of the moralistic, self-righteous, judgmental Christians that I meet. Anybody ever heard that? Anybody ever thought that? If your hand's not up, you can't hear me? What? <laughs> you're, not, you're living in a cave, a Christian cave? You don't interact with people? That's the common thing that I hear in the world today. Is I, I'm interested in spirituality and even in Jesus' message, but I don't, the behavior of Christians in the world. Look, look just for a second here. What I'm looking out at is predominantly a group of white evangelical Christians who are over 40. Do we all agree on that? I mean, there's some exceptions, but most of you. Do you know what the world thinks of you? Do you know what the world thinks of you? White, evangelical, suburban, upper-class Christians over 40. Privileged, narrow, judgmental, angry. I know you, and I know that's not true. I know your hearts. Let's not be by our behavior in the world, the kind of people that are a barrier. You want the power of Jesus flowing into your life and through your life or in others, you've got to get over yourself and you've got to get over the crowd. And here's how this works sometimes in the church even. You can come to church for a long time and you can start to import some things into the gospel, political views, social views, and you can make those things part of the gospel and you can think this is what it means to have Jesus. You've got to get past that. You've got to get back to who he is. You know what you find when you encounter Jesus in the Gospels on every page? He is every bit as angry about and against moralistic, self-righteous people as you are. More so, even. The only place Jesus thunders in the Gospels is not against broken people, sinful people, but against self-righteous religious people. That's where he gets the most, that's where he thunders most. That ought to make, give us pause for a minute. How did Zacchaeus deal with this issue? He found a way to encounter Jesus despite the crowd. So must you. So must we. To find out who Jesus really is. And if you do this, you know what you find? There's some very interesting people up in the tree with you. In Matthew 21, Jesus actually says that the pimps and the prostitutes are getting salvation ahead of the social, religious, moral elites. Too many of us, I think, base our beliefs and our sense of who Christ is and what the gospel is based on the faith of the people around us. And I'm not saying that people can't encourage you in your faith and you can't learn from others. Of course you can. That's why we care about small groups and do things around here in group settings. But you must meet Jesus. You must encounter him. To do that, you have to get over yourself, your own pride, and get over the crowd. The degree to which the people around you might be in the way. And let us not be in the way. I want people to see Jesus through my life. I want to be a conduit for them to meet him. Don't you want to be that? I shudder to think that I might be a barrier sometimes. 
you want the salvation of Jesus to be working in your life, you need, you need to climb up a tree, get over yourself, and get over the crowd. And finally, second, but lastly, and third, to take Jesus home. Take Jesus home. Now, let me read verses 7 through 10. And when they saw it, so verse 6, he says, So he hurried home and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they, the, the religious leaders, they grumbled, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Taking Jesus home, what does this mean? Now, in traditional evangelical subculture, the way it's sometimes been referred to is you must invite Jesus into your heart. Have you ever heard that phrase, that saying? I believe in that. I know many of you have done that. I've done that. There's nothing wrong with that. But isn't it curious that Jesus does not wait to be invited over? Do you notice that? He does not wait for Zacchaeus to invite him over. He says, I'm coming over. Come down, I'm coming over. What do you do when God says, I'm coming over? Uh, let me clean up first. My wife would say, give us a week. Right? So we've got some dusting to do. Right? What do you do? I'm coming over. Uh. How many of you don't like to be surprised by guests in your home? You want to tidy up, right? Jesus says, I'm coming today. Today. It's a remarkable thing. Even the path Jesus took, why is he in Jericho? He's passing through on his way to Jerusalem. He knows this man by name. Remember garbage guy? His name is Mike. He has a name, people. He matters to God, people. Jesus knows this man, Zacchaeus, by name. He knows you by name. He calls him down apart from the crowd. Two key implications here. The first thing is the order of grace. It's tempting to read this and think, well, because Zacchaeus gave away his possessions and paid back fourfold all that he cheated people out of, that that means that Jesus then pronounces salvation. It's tempting to read it that way. It almost sounds that way, doesn't it? Oh, look, he did right by God, God did right by him. But that's not what's happening here, actually. Remember what the table means. When Jesus says, I must come to be a a guest in your home, he's going to stay for a while. They're going to eat together. They're going to fellowship together. He's coming into the home, into the table, which was symbolically the, the center of your life. Jesus comes over first into the center of Zacchaeus' life, and then something happens to Zacchaeus. Don't get the order of grace wrong. God initiates. God comes in. God forgives. God restores, and we begin to change. Not the other way around. Not get your act together, put dust clean, vacuum, put away all the junk, put on good appearances. I know when I come to your house that behind one of those doors is all the stuff that was out before we got there, right? And look good, and then God says, hmm, okay. After Zacchaeus has announced he's going to give away half his possessions and pay back those he's cheated, Jesus does not say, okay, now salvation has come. What he says is, because I've come into your home, this is evidence that you too are a child of Israel, a son of Abraham. Isn't that what Zacchaeus longed for? We read that, child of Abraham, son of Israel, and we think, well, what? Isn't that what Zacchaeus was cut off from? The people of God? Hated by his own people? Because of his own behavior and his own sin, but cut off from the family of God, what he longed for was to know that God loved him and could forgive him and accept him and give him a place back in the family at the table. And that's precisely what Jesus does. I must come to your house today. I'm going to show you tangibly that God loves you. God forgives you. God accepts you. And he pronounces it then. The first implication of taking Jesus home is the order of grace, that God initiates, God restores, God comes in. The second implication, then, of taking Jesus home is that when God comes in to the center of your life, it results in change. 
praying magic words, Jesus, come into my heart and forgive my sin. It's not hocus pocus. It's not a get out of hell free card you put in your pocket someday. If that's sincere, if the Holy Spirit does come into your life, if God really does reside in your heart and forgive sin, it will inevitably produce change. Not perfection, but progress. Who are we talking about here? Who's coming in? Think about it for a minute, friends. Who's coming into Zacchaeus' home? Who is coming into your life? The God of the universe, the high king of heaven, the one who put all things in place, the one by which all things hold together, by a word of his power, speaks and there's light. That God comes into a human heart? How could you be unchanged? How could you possibly be the same resentful, fearful, anxious, unforgiving, greedy, untrusting person? Now, I'm not saying you should go, oh, if I'm not perfect, that means he's not residing in me. I'm saying... If God comes in, things change. That's what God does. He changes things. He restores things. And that's what, that's what the story is telling us. God seeks. God comes in. God forgives and restores. And something happens to Zacchaeus. He's not the same guy anymore. Dallas Willard in his book, The Divine Conspiracy, said, One of the surest signs of spiritual growth are the thoughts that no longer occur to you. I like that. This used to be an issue for me, and I don't even think that way anymore. It's not always instantaneous and miraculous like Zacchaeus. I years ago talked to a guy who was, uh, had a chance to lead him to faith in Christ. He was, he was actually a, a, a gun dealer. He sold black market firearms to people that shouldn't have them in the streets of Chicago. Moved to the suburbs to get away from an investigation, actually. Came to faith in Christ. I had a chance to be with a group that were ministering to him. Lead him to faith in Jesus. He had drug addictions and all kinds of issues. And God just miraculously took a bunch of it away. Gone. Because I don't think there's any other way for him. But for many of us, it doesn't happen like that. It happens slowly over time. Two steps forward, one step back. Isn't that true for you? Slow growth over time into the grace of of knowing Jesus. The home, friends, the table, the center of your life is where Jesus wants to come, where he wants to be. Let me read to you. And by, and by the way, we don't often think this, make this connection, but Luke 19, the story of Zacchaeus, is really an answer to the question that was asked in Luke 18. We won't get into it, we don't have time now, but if you go back and read Luke 18, the story of the rich young ruler, you know this story? And he goes away sad because he had great wealth. Do you remember that part of the story? Jesus says, give away all you have, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and follow me. And the guy leaves sad because he couldn't, make, he couldn't do it. That was his issue. And Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. You remember the story. Nod if you're with me. Go nod off, just nod. Good. Right? And the disciples say, well, who, who can be saved? This, who can be saved? They, they despair then. Because wealth in their mind was a sign of God's blessing. And what does Jesus say? He says, nobody can. With God, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Zacchaeus' story is an answer to that question, isn't it? Who can be saved? Certainly not the traitor, the collaborator with Rome, the cheat Zacchaeus. Yes, even him. With God, all things are possible. Yes, even him. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, you'll know this by heart, many of you. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. And what? Say it. Eat with him. Sup with him. What is he saying? Why eat? That's the symbol, friends. I will come right into the center of your life. We'll sit down together. We'll break bread together. And what's that symbol mean? I love you. I accept you. We're at peace. That's what Jesus wants. That's where change happens. Not in intellectual assent to a certain doctrines. Not in church attendance. Not in doing good things so that God is pleased with you. That's all wonderful, well, and good. But real change happens when he comes all the way in. Sits down. And you sit down with him. And there's fellowship. And there's forgiveness, and there's grace, and there's healing, and there's restoration. Then all of a sudden, you're not worried about what the world thinks anymore. You just can't wait to tell people about what he's done. 
Isn't that Zacchaeus? I love when he says, look, Lord, look. It's like, look, Daddy. Look, look. I'm giving away my money, and, 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 look, I'll give fourfold back what I've cheated. He's not thinking about the cost. He's full of joy about what has happened in his life. Now I look at many of you, and I know you've been walking with God for a long time, for years. Is it possible, though, you still need to open your heart and let him all the way in for real change to happen? That's where he wants to be. That's what he wants to do. That's what he comes down and calls your name and says, come into your house. Today, coming over. Will you let him in? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful that the order of grace begins with you, not us. Help us by your spirit to get over ourselves, to get past the crowd, and to let you in. We thank you this is precisely where you want to reside and transform our lives. We pray this in your name, Jesus, and for your sake and glory. Amen.